الرسول أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا وقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب شح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وقفنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزقنا اجتنابه آمين يا رب Last week I was talking about domestic violence but as I'm looking today I see a lot of young kids here and I'm almost in the mood of changing my topic because of I guess it's Thanksgiving and so there's more of the younger crowd here today I will I'm thinking still in my head am I going to talk about the same topic or a different topic uh, let me start by mentioning something that will relate to this, something important that sometimes we don't re realize about the Prophet wasallam, And that is that generally our concept of prophethood, there are a few concepts about being a prophet that I want to clarify today. <laughs> Generally our concept of, pro so the, number one, generally our concept of prophethood. So I'm making it clear, I'm not talking about domestic violence today, even though that is what I prepared for. I'm talking about prophethood, okay, in Islam, because the kids are here. So this is just so the adults and everybody understands. Inshallah, after the fundraiser, after next week, then I will come back to the topic of domestic violence, because of the youth being here. So the first thing about prophethood is this, one misconception, and that is that people assume about prophethood that <laughs> it means that the prophet says nothing from himself and everything he says is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't, you know, almost like the prophet is a puppet, you know, a puppeteer. And the, the puppet master is Allah, and the puppeteer is the prophet. And the prophet has no uh, self-determination, self-will. And he is only doing, and he only says whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him. This uh, idea of prophethoods, of the prophets, of, of any of the prophets, is essentially incorrect. The correct way of understanding it is the prophet wasallam has full authority of ijtihad. He does whatever he wills. If he makes a mistake, then Allah tells him, you made a mistake. This is how it is. It is not that the Prophet ﷺ has no freedom, no self-freedom. And this is very important because in Islamic law, we make a distinction. Like for example, there's a saying of the Prophet ﷺ. Like, I'll give you an example from the fiqh of Imam Shafi, there is an issue like this. But there is an issue, like for example, if the Prophet ﷺ was in argument with his wife, was he in an argument with his wife as a prophet or was he in an argument with his wife as a, a husband? So whatever he was saying to his wife, if he was upset, he was saying as, a, you know, as he was, Allah was saying it to Aisha. No, this is not the correct assessment. If the Prophet made a mistake, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal verses of the Quran telling the Prophet, you made a mistake here, you shouldn't have done this. And there are many examples, many examples, but there's one in particular that I want to share with you. <clears throat> and that is in Surah Muhammad. Because it gives you, uh, it, it opens up a few doors from that one example. It opens up a few things. So I'm going to go to Surah Muhammad. Or rather than that, I'll actually just explain it. There's a verse of the Quran. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet Because you know when Allah is saying something, I'll give you an example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet This is another example, this is in, in another surah Allah said to the Prophet I will not forgive the munafiqeen, I will not forgive the hypocrites Those people who claim to be Muslims But in their hearts they had reservations and were playing both sides Okay? La ha'ulai wa la ha'ulai They were really of not both sides but outside they were saying they were professing Islam, but inside they were not sure. 
about such people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, O Prophet of Allah, even if you ask forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah said, I will not forgive them. So how did the Prophet relate to this ayah? The Prophet said, meaning, generally if your attitude is harsh, you're, gonna, you're going to say, if I do istighfar for them 70 times, Allah will not forgive them, means Allah will never forgive them. If you do 70 istighfars for them, 70 times the Prophet of Allah, of all people, asks for forgiveness, Allah will not forgive, for them, uh, forgive them. But the Messenger of Allah took it from the perspective that fine, I'll do it more than 70 times. I will do it more than 70 times. And in this actually, there was a, argu a small argument at one time between Umar bin Khattab, where <coughs> Umar bin Khattab said, Allah said, Allah will not forgive the munafiqeen. Why are you leading the janazah of a munafiq? And after, see now, for example, this is another example. The Prophet led the janazah of a hypocrite. Somebody who was two-faced. On the one side, trying to work out things with the Quraysh, and on the other side, working with the Muslims. And Allah said, after that event, even though the Prophet led his janazah, and Umar bin Khattab tried to stop him, and the, Umar said to him, Allah will not forgive them. If you forg ask forgiveness them 70 times, the Prophet responded, I will do it more than 70 times. Then Allah revealed the verse saying that you cannot lead the janazah of any of the munafiqeen. A verse of the Quran came down. So the Prophet, he did his own interpretation, his own ijtihad. When he did an ijtihad that was wrong, for example, in this case, he led the janazah of a munafiq. So Allah said, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa you cannot lead the janazah of a munafiq. Because <clears throat> there's many reasons, because we had to be able to filter who were the right people and who were the wrong people in history, right? Who are the people we will take the narrations from? Who, uh, who are the people we will take the ahadith from? And so, anyway, it has many purposes. The point I'm trying to make here is that there was a verse revealed in Surah Muhammad where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet that oh, Pro the interpretation can be done just like this. I gave the example, Allah will not forgive them unless you ask forgiveness 70 times, it can be interpreted two ways. Means Allah will never forgive them, the way Umar bin Khattab did, or that you can do more than 70 times and then maybe Allah will forgive them. In the same way, a verse was revealed in Surah Al-Muhammad in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet, O oh, oh Prophet of Allah, so two interpretations I'm going to give you. If you take prisoners of war, you may be, you may be kind to them, let them go. And if you take prisoners of war, you can also ransom them. But not until, not until the war has come to a complete end. Now this can have two interpretations. One is you do not take prisoners of war till the war has come to an end. And the other interpretation is that you can take prisoners of war instead of killing them, instead of fighting them, instead of being aggressive, you can take them as prisoners of war. The Prophet cho chose the the one that had more mercy, instead of just take them as prisoners of war. And instead of what? Instead of that we will take prisoners of the war, once all the people have laid down their weapons, then we will take the prisoners of war is what the verse wanted. The Prophet gave it the interpretation, no, we will take the prisoners of war even during the war. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed another verse saying that the point is that the Prophet took a lenient explanation of the Qur'an. A mercy, he put mercy to the explanation and the interpretation of the Qur'an. And another verse was revealed telling the Prophet that from now on, Allah is making it clear that you cannot take prisoners of war until uh, you have subdued the land. Okay. I hope I was clear on this issue. The point I'm trying to make with this is that sometimes there are verses in which the Prophet ﷺ made his ijtihad. He made his opinion, and then Allah revealed and said, no, no, this is the right way. So the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have full freedom. This is what we, is the sunnah of the prophet. They have full freedom to make their own ijtihad, to make their own opinion. If they make a mistake, Allah comes down with a verse. Can everybody please come forward? <coughs> Everybody, keep coming forward, keep coming forward. Thank you, Dr. Nisha.
second misconception about prophethood is that we think that Allah just sent messengers and then he kept sending messengers and more messengers and finally one day Allah decided okay I've decided Muhammad وسلم, will be the last messenger there's no more need for any messengers it just is an arbitrary time period where Allah says okay no more messengers this is also incorrect you know in the issue of the for example the Ahmadiyya or the Qadiani for example where they say there was a prophet after prophet Muhammad this is a very important issue to understand messengers were sent according to the level that the, the social evolution had taken place. So if there was a, tr if there was, if human beings were in tribal society, you can only give certain levels of laws for a tribal society. You can't give complex laws for a tribal society. You can, you can give the Ten Commandments. For example, they had tribes in the time of Musa والسلام, so they got the Ten Commandments, easy to understand. But as societies evolved, there were no longer tribal societies. Now they became empires big societies, sophisticated societies. Then more guidance was needed. Then those uh, issues of how transactions are done in Islam, so on and so forth, economic issues, uh, standards of, uh, issues of standard of what is, m the definition of what is money even, to what is a valid trans transaction in Islam, and all the different forms of transactions. They were clarified later on because humanity didn't need them when they were in a tribal society. So you have to understand the coming of messengers as not a linear process, but a process reaching a climax. So you had, at the time of Adam والسلام, you can say just fam even not complete even tribes in the beginning. Then you had tribes. Then you have, for example, Quraysh was one tribe, and Mecca was one, one tribe. But Medina was a more complex society. They had five Jewish tribes, three, tri three Jewish tribes within Medina, you also had the Aws and the Khazraj, many tribes, multi-tribes living together. But then at that same time you have the Byzantine Empire. For example, the, 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 the great Byzantine Empire was also existing at that time. So the coming of the Messenger of Allah, this is what I wanted to say, was not a linear process, but was a process coming to a climax. When Allah said, Today I have completed your deen. This deen that started with Adam والسلام, and more and more guidance was being given as societies were developing. And when humanity had reached its zenith in its maturity, this is one of the reasons, I can't go into details, why is one of the reasons that no miracles were given, so to say, miracles for the claim of prophethood was not given to Prophet Muhammad like the previous prophets? Because it was understood that humanity has reached a certain level of maturity. That that is not what is now, now needed. <coughs> Something else is needed, and that was Quran. That we will uh, talk about another time. But I only want to make the point, when the Prophet came, all the laws that are needed for humanity, for guidance, they were given, they were completed. That guidance that Allah wanted to give humanity, but could not have been given before. And slowly as societies developed, finally it was completely exfoliated in the personality of the Prophet وسلم, and in the advent of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, this is what it is. So number one, Prophet Muhammad can do his own ijtihad if he makes a mistake in his ijtihad, he makes a mistake in his opinion. Because Prophet Muhammad was very merciful, you can say. So because of his mercy, sometimes he did something and Allah didn't uh, approve of it. Allah wanted him to be a little bit more tough. For example, this is one example. So this is one issue. The Prophet could make his ijtihad, if he made a mistake, what he came down to tell him, revelation came down to tell him, this is how it should have been done, not this way. Second, you all know the famous Abasa wa Tawalla, right? The blind man. So the same thing. The Prophet made his ijtihad, if he did something Allah felt was wrong, that didn't meet the criteria of innaka la ala khuluqin azim, if it didn't meet the criteria that Allah knows he is at, then Allah came down with guidance for him. Second was that prophethood as a, as a process is not a linear process, it was reaching its climax. The Sharia was being completed, the book. This is why in some places, by the way, for all the books, you can say only the word book is used. Al-Kitab, for example. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرَقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ only kitab is mentioned here, but it means all the books. 
Because it was all reaching the law of Allah or the book of Allah was reaching a climax. Today I've perfected my deen for you. I've completed it. This is why you also find in the Quran, whenever previous prophets are mentioned, it mentions huda wa rahma. Huda, guidance, but not the guidance. Al huda is Quran. Al huda is Quran. It was now the final completion, the final teaching. Humanity can now understand and take from God, so to say, the teachings, the complete amount of teachings that Allah wanted to give humanity. This is the second clarification about prophethood that I wanted to give. The third, uh, third, I will not be able to maybe do because it's going to take some time, and I wanted to talk about another topic today. So, inshallah, I will talk about that second topic, which is a separate topic from this topic. Uh, and then, if I have time, then I will mention about the third misconception people have have about prophethood. But I, I will only mention this. Following a prophet, just as we say in Islam, the idea of la ilaha illallah, there's no divine, there's no divine except for Allah, this is part of human fitrah. To accept this, to understand this reality is part of human nature. That there's no, this is, this is so to say, it is inside us that there is only one God. This is very natural for us, that there is a God and there's, there can only be one one creator of the whole universe. This is very natural. In the same way now I'm saying, now listen to me. In the same way I'm saying, it is just as natural to accept prophethood. Why? Now this is a lengthy psychological discussion, but every human being, I'm going to give it to you the gist of it. Then one day, inshallah, I'll discuss it in more detail. Every human being wants to follow a hero. Every human being wants to follow the wise man. This is inside us. Just as Tawheed is within us. The yearning to follow someone great. The yearning to be on a quest with a, uh, with a warrior. To be on a quest with a wise man. To be on a quest with a great leader. This is within us. It is human nature to become part and to be part of a quest or a journey of some great leader. Everybody wants to be on the winning team and everybody wants to follow a great leader and everybody wants to follow somebody like our image of Abu Bakr and Umar and the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The idea that you believe in prophethood is the, is the, is the, is the, is the you can say the sublime example of that yearning that is within human beings to want to follow some leadership. Why else? What type of leadership this was? That where people were following every aspect of the Prophet. Even his habits were being copied. Which wasn't part of, necessarily always part of Sharia. To even copy his habits is not part of Islamic law per se. But this was the type of leadership. This following this type of leadership is as innate to human nature. And to human need as the idea that there is, that there can be only one God. Inshallah, in my next khutbah, I'm talking about like another issue, inshallah. Aqul qawli hadha astaghfirullah li ulakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wa al-muslimina. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Please, if you can still come forward, please come forward. There's still people standing. Inshallah. فصحوا يفصح الله لكم. Give space. Allah will give space to you. Inshallah, keep coming forward. There are more people coming. Every time I say more people are coming, more the door opens again. And there's still people standing. Okay, now, so people just understand, keep moving forward. I need to go in, inshallah. I have five minutes. 
There are two <laughs> types of giving in Islam. Please notice what I'm going to, I'm going to explain something very important today. One type of giving is, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءٌ وَلَا شَكُورًا Even before I mention this, let me mention something. In nifaq, which means hypocrisy. Nifaq means hypocrisy. Every true Muslim is worried whether if I'm a hypocrite. And everyone who's a hypocrite is never worried if I'm a hypocrite. The cure to nifaq, the cure to hypocrisy in Islam is infaq, is to spend. Your heart will be where your money is. This is what Sutul Munafiqun teaches us. If somebody, is, if somebody wants to make sure I'm not a Munafiq, that I don't have this disease, that I am sincere to Islam, I'm sincere and loyal to the cause of Islam, the cure to that, to make sure of that, the cure is you give and spend in the cause of Islam. Now, after saying this, there are two types of giving in Islam. There are different words in Quran for giving. Nut'imukum, for example, ita is zakah, ata, so on and so forth. So many words. To give. They mean to give. The most important of them, by the way, is infaq. And infaq, there are two types. There are two types of giving. Zakat is also used. But there are two types of giving. One is to give to human to Muslims because they are they deserve more because they're poor. We don't have a concept of charity, by the way, in Islam. Let me also clarify this point. Charity is, you know, I'm defining charity so that when I'm saying there's no concept of the, the charity, I'm defining concept of charity myself and then saying there's no, that concept doesn't exist. Oh, these poor people, let's give them $5. This concept of we feel, sorry, you're poor, no, if somebody is poor, Islamically, this is the will of Allah. But what Islam wants is not that you give them some dollars and then you feel good about yourself. Okay, I did my job. No, Islam doesn't want this. Islam wants you to help that poor person stand on his feet so he becomes part of the community, becomes a productive member of that community. This is what iqamus salah wa ita'u zakah means. Not just you give some money so that next month he needs, so one month he had a good, good, healthy, uh, you know, he, his, his bills were paid for one month, and then the next month he's in the same pro It shouldn't be that the same people are coming for zakat every year, every year, every year. This is not the purpose of zakat. Then your list of zakat will only increase. Whereas in the time of uh, Omar, uh, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, the list of the people that needed zakat decreased. Because when they gave money, they made sure they can stand on their feet. 